Hey, everybody. So this week, both halves of the lecture are recorded. So this is the first part. And then after this, you should watch the second part, which is on Dropbox and YouTube. And there's a third thing you need to do this week as well, which is watch the video walking tour of Brooklyn Heights. So I would suggest you watch both lectures first and then do the walking tour, but you could, you could watch the walking tour before the lectures if you want, it doesn't really matter. I think it would make more sense if you did the lectures first and then do the walking tour. Um, okay, so here's first the first part of lecture number nine. This is part one, so you're going to want to watch this and listen to it and then go to part two. So let's shift a little bit and talk about housing. Um, this third part of the course is about neighborhoods and housing. And so I want to talk about this a little bit. And we're going to come back to Brooklyn Heights in order to talk about it. But um, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about housing. And I want to start with something that in America became known as the federal period, kind of after the fact. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about um, different periods of housing, starting with the federal, and then we're gonna, next week we'll move on to the Greek revival and the Gothic revival and the Italian age, things like that. This is really, these are periods where you can't really pin down dates because it's really all about fashion and technology. And so modes of housing would come into fashion and get replicated. And then they would gradually change into another, another mode or style. So the federal period though is roughly in America, roughly 1780s, like right after the American revolution um, to the 1830s. But it's those, those dates are very rough. It's just kind of, uh, that was kind of the golden age of the period. I would say the golden age of the period was like 1820s, which we're gonna talk about. So where did, this, where did this federal mode of housing come? It was derived from the Georgian period architecture of Europe and especially England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. And um, this is some housing in Edinburgh, Scotland. Georgian housing. And it has a lot of the elements that will appear later in American federal architecture. One of them is the so-called fan light doorway. And this is talked about in the reading you're gonna be doing in Bricks and Brownstone. They go through all of this in, in a lot of detail. And also in the the row house manual that is on Dropbox. They go through all of these different parts of the buildings. Uh, but these kind of, uh, these details were derived from classical architecture and Renaissance architecture. And then they were um, adapted in American architecture of the 18th and 19th centuries. Here's another example in Edinburgh, Scotland. The, the main thing here is the, the classical details, but also a kind of simplicity and a restraint uh, compared to some of the modes of housing that we're gonna see later in the 19th century, which were much more exuberant and ornamental. Georgian architecture is really um, very economical, very restrained, and it's relying more on classical proportion. So then in America, Georgia architecture is adapted. Uh, this is um, housing at um, Harvard, Massachusetts Hall, 
which still exists. And it's an extremely early building for America, 1718. Still there, so it looks great. Um, but again, you can see not a lot of detail, not a lot of embellishment, really just relying on proportion and symmetry. It's always about symmetry. And in public buildings in America, Georgian architecture expressed itself in a little bit more detail and exuberance, but um, still compared to what came later, like Gothic architecture, for instance, still very restrained. And of course, you know this building, I'm not even going to tell you what it is, but it was built in 1766 and it's on Lower Broadway. By now you should know what this building is. So this is Georgian architecture in America. And it was, why was it called Georgian architecture? Well, going back to England, it was named after the succession of Georges, King George I, II, III. So that period uh, when the Georges were in power, the architecture became nicknamed Georgian after the King Georges. And then when it came to America before the revolution, it was also known as Georgian architecture. So St. Paul's Ah, I gave it away. This is St. Paul's Chapel from 1766. At the time, it would have been referred to as Georgian architecture, just as Massachusetts Hall at Harvard University would have been called Georgian architecture. So then the revolution happens, 1776 to 1783. And then after the revolution, when the American colonies become the United States of America, no self-respecting red-blooded American revolutionary is going to call anything Georgian after the British king. And uh, so they weren't going to call it that. And uh, also you'll notice that a lot of name changes happen in that period. In New York, um, King Street, uh, the name, that name was changed to something I can't remember. Queen Street, that name was changed. King's College was the name was changed to Columbia College, today's Columbia University, et cetera, et cetera. So they they were not comfortable calling anything uh, after the British Crown. But um, so the Georgian architecture became eventually known as federal architecture, but that was a label that was applied much later. Um, at the time, late 18th, early 19th century, they didn't really call it federal architecture. They, they, if they called it anything, they called it modern architecture, interestingly enough. It was kind of just the current modern American architecture. And that was predominantly the kind of architecture that was the most fashionable and the most um, likely to be built in New York in the early 19th century when the, um, the commissioner's plan is instigated in 1811. Manhattan and Brooklyn Heights are cut into a grid. And this leads to the subdivision of the streets, block, street blocks into building lots, which are then bought and sold housing starts to fly up and uh, and that was the type of building that was tending to go up. And we mentioned in relationship to the opening of the Erie Canal that uh, there were so many thousands of houses built um, every year around the period that the canal opened. I think I said that there were 1600 houses built in 1824 or maybe it was 1825. And uh, so we mentioned that uh, as, a, as a product of the, the Erie Canal, but I wanna actually look at those buildings, the type of building that kind of took over New York and, and, and talk about them. They're really incredibly beautiful buildings, very simple buildings and 
there are not many of them left in the city today, which stands to reason because they're small and they were in the way of progress in many places in the city. And um, that was 200 years ago. So time kind of took care of a lot of them. Um, but there still are here and there in pockets of the city, there's still federal housing from this period, the, the canal boom housing. Uh, you can see it in, you can see a lot of them in Greenwich Village and uh, in West Soho and in Brooklyn Heights. Those are the best places to see them. But every once in a while, I will just see one peeking out somewhere between two other buildings. So here's one in Manhattan. Um, and this is what would have, what later would be called federal housing. And this is a whole row of them in West Soho. Here's another one just down the block. And I already mentioned that. There's an emphasis on restraint and proportion, uh, classical details, but, but uh, not very embellished, not a lot of decoration. They often had pitched roofs, but not always. This one has a flat roof. Um, sometimes they're two stories, sometimes they're three. Let's look at some of the parts of the, of the facade. Later um, in a future lecture, I'll take you inside and show you how the inside layout worked. But let's just look at the facades right now. Um, if you look up there at the top, there are these windows peeking out of the attic, and those are called dormers. And that was often um, where the uh, servants would live. At this point, even the working class could afford a servant or two. Um, because of all the cheap labor that was coming over and all the immigrants that were coming over and uh, uh, not as drastic a difference between uh, wealthy and middle class and working class. And so a lot of these houses, even though the people that lived in them were not particularly wealthy by today's standards, they might have a servant or two. Uh, or they would have uh, extra bedrooms up there for their children up in the attic. And sometimes more than one family lived in these houses, even though they're pretty small. So those rooms were definitely used up there in the attic. And so the, those windows peeking out are called dormers. And that's one characteristic of this period of architecture. And then the lintels are the, the um, upper part of the windowsill. And the lintels and the sills, the lower part in this, Federal period of architecture, very simple, very simple. Um, not a lot of, sometimes you see some detail in them, but uh, some, uh, I mean, some uh, ornamentation, but, but not a lot, pretty, pretty simple. The interface between the wall and the, and the roof is called the cornice. And this is often a, a chance uh, to, to put some very simple restrained decoration. You can see in this house, the cornice has these repetitive wood blocks, which are called a dental course, like because they look kind of like teeth, dental course. And the function of the cornice is to attach the roof to the, to the wall, which in architecture is, is tricky because that's where water likes to leak in. So it's a, a way of getting water off the roof. And so they often project in later periods of housing, the cornice really kind of gets out of control and becomes this big artistic statement that really cantilevers from the, from the wall, uh, which I love. But I also love the restraint of these early uh, cornices. Um, and then you can see here the brick has a very specific pattern often in the federal period architecture. Not always, but often it's um, a pattern called Flemish bond. And I'm not sure if, I guess you haven't had uh, construction technology courses yet, or maybe you have. Uh, so you probably haven't learned the different ways of arranging bricks to form different courses. 
this is definitely talked about in Bricks and Brownstone and in um, the Row House Manual on Dropbox. So you're going to want to check that out. It kind of explains it in more detail. But basically, the idea behind Flemish Bond uh, is that you have a stretcher, which is the the brick presented in the uh, long uh, the long direction. So you're seeing the full side of the brick. That's called a stretcher. And then the header is a brick turned inward. So you're seeing the end of the brick. So you're seeing side of the brick, end of the brick, side of the brick, end of the brick. So it's going stretcher, header, stretcher, header in alternating courses. So that's called Flemish bond. And there's a bunch of other different courses like English bond and things like that um, and different ways of arranging bricks. Uh, there's something called a soldier course where it's up on, on its end, et cetera. But uh, the thing to know for the federal period buildings is that typically it was Flemish bond. And that's, so that's, a, the, all of these details are interesting because it, when you're walking around the city, if you see these, it's often a way of uh, doing some detective work and, and gives you a clue of when the building was built, um, which is just such a cool thing to begin to understand. To be able to be a detective like that and walk down a block and understand more or less when buildings were built and when parts of buildings were added and which parts are original, and which parts aren't. I mean, it, it's I find that tremendously exciting. Maybe that's just me. Here's another uh, better diagram of it that you can see how this was built. So it's a double uh, course of, of uh, brick. So you can see that they can be arranged so that they're, uh, you're either seeing the long face, the stretcher, or the short face, which is the header. And the brick walls were um, typically two bricks wide. So what is that pattern called? So the doorways in federal period buildings were another chance to express a little bit of ornament, although again, nothing compared to the Greek revival and the Gothic revival, the Italianate, which we'll look at later. But this is kind of a just a typical classical federal period doorway. And I want to take you through some of the parts here. And again, this is covered in the Bricks and Brownstone reading and the uh, row house name. So up above that window, above the door is called a transom. Uh, the little uh, columns are two full columns and two half columns. Uh, and those have, if you can see those, they have very tiny ionic capitals, classical detailing there at the top of them. And in this case, they're built, this is all built out of wood, the colonnettes. And then on the side, between the colonnettes, to the side of the door, there are these narrow little windows called side lights. And then finally, these houses are elevated a half story typically above the street. So you walk up and those that ascent up to the parlor level is by a stoop. And uh, the stoop, of course, became uh, a feature of neighborhoods all over New York. And it was such a wonderful device, is such a wonderful device, and still goes a long way toward defining the whole city, the streetscapes of the city. Apparently, stoops were something that the Dutch brought over when they first you know, founded New Amsterdam. That's the story I heard, anyway. I, there's, some people doubt whether that's actually true or not, but uh, it kind of makes sense to me. In Amsterdam, it was prone to flooding, and so they would build their houses up a half level, and that was the reason that they developed the stoop. And the stoop is, is such a, a wonderful space in its own right. Um, it's a place for people to gather, not just to walk up and down. And the the image of a family gathered on their stoop on a summer night, you know, eating ice cream and watching fireflies and talking to their neighbors is such an enduring New York image and, and especially a Brooklyn image. You know, Brooklyn is really a, um, uh, a city of neighborhoods and 
the stoop is really an iconic feature of New York housing. And we're gonna see stoops over and over and over in the examples that I show you. So that's kind of the intro to some of the features of federal architecture as derived from its Georgian precedents. Um, this is kind of like a typical federal period doorway, although there's just infinite numbers of different, infinite varieties of this. And going back to the Edinburgh housing that I showed you, the fan light is the semicircular um, window above the door is often, uh, you can see that often instead of this rectangular transom. So sometimes the doorways are arched, which we'll see in a second. So now I want to go back to Brooklyn Heights and back to the 1820s. So back to when it was, the ferry starts running in 1814. It's laid out in 1817. The first building lots are sold in 1819. And then builders um, start building houses and people start moving there and it, and it becomes New York's first suburb. So who built these houses? Now that's an interesting question. So architecture wasn't, uh, as a profession, wasn't really like it is today. There wasn't, there weren't architecture schools. There wasn't any process for licensing. So there wasn't as much distinction between an architect and a builder. Today, of course, everything has been very codified um, by lawyers, you know, and, uh, and so now you're an architect. And you can also be a contractor, but often a, or an engineer, but these are, these are separate realms. You can be a design build architect, which is honestly is a great way to go because you can control the quality of what you're building. Uh, but often there you're as an architect or an engineer, you're dealing with a separate contractor and then the contractor is dealing with subcontractors, et cetera, et cetera. So things are getting more and more specialized. But 200 years ago, if you wanted to, to build something, you would hire uh, an architect, maybe. There were certainly architects practicing, like John McComb, somebody we've talked about. Um, or you would hire a builder, and a lot of the builders were able to design houses on their own and were basically like architects, but, but called themselves builders. And a lot of times they were working not from original designs, but from uh, pattern books. And this is talked about in Bricks and Brownstone that uh, a lot of the row housing looks very much the same because it was replicated. There were kind of uh, designs A, B, and C and variations D, E, and F. And uh, somebody might, a developer might buy an entire block or half a block and put up six or seven houses that are either identical or variations of the same thing. Um, and there were these books that were published, these pattern books where it would, it would show a facade, a typical layout, typical details, like this doorway would have been uh, drawn and um, as an example, there would be an example of a cornice detail. And a builder could take these books and, and build the designs from the book. So a lot of these houses that we're seeing were built that way. Um, and probably built that way more often than not. And the idea that you could hire an architect, especially somebody of the stature of John McComb, that was kind of more a pursuit of the, of the wealthy. Um, and Brooklyn Heights, I have to say, initially, and this is an important point, was very wealthy. Um, these were people who could, they were typically like you know, bankers and insurance people in the, in the lower part of Manhattan, Wall Street, going back and forth from home to work. And so they had money. The initial development in Brooklyn was people with money. And then Brooklyn Heights, then uh, by the late 19th century with, uh, in the early 20th century with the coming of the subway started to attract more artists and actors and writers the original residents, a lot of them tended to move away. By the mid 20th century, Brooklyn Heights had really slid downhill and was uh, actually really sketchy and dangerous. And then just in the last 40 years or so, it's really come back. And now, now it's probably 
I don't know, one of the top two or three wealthiest neighborhoods in the city. Uh, houses go for bazillions of dollars now, but it wasn't always like that. So it's kind of returned to its original social standing, I guess you could say. So let's look at some, some buildings in Brooklyn Heights. We're looking at buildings from the federal period. So this is a building, Eugene Boisselet House at the corner of mid and Willow. And this is 1829 or maybe earlier, maybe a little later, but basically 1820s. So this is part of that first wave of construction in Brooklyn Heights. This is a federal house, definitely. It's got the pitched roof. It's got two dormer windows up at the top. The material here is not brick. This is clabbered wood, wood clabbered siding, which you also see a lot. Uh, it's two stories plus an attic. And then this is extremely unusual because the house extends into the back to a carriage house. I don't think it was, this was unusual when, it, when Brooklyn Heights was first developed, but it's unusual that one of these houses survived intact. It has an attached, or detached rather, carriage house in the back garden with a wall connecting them, connecting the, the house to the carriage house with a garden in between. So really unusual. And then this is the doorway. So exactly, pretty much exactly like the last example I showed you. This is all in wood. All of this is original. Still works just like it did in the 1820s, 200 years ago, except when you're there in person, you can see it, parts of it are kind of sagging a little bit, but it's all still intact. You have the uh, transom window above the door, the little wooden colonnettes on either side of the door, the side lights in between the colonnettes, and then you get up there by climbing up a stoop. So just down the block, here's another house, uh, federal period. This is from the 1830s, 1833. Uh, federal period house in brick, again. Um, it has the arch doorway this time, instead of the square doorway. And this is an interesting example because um, you can really do some detective work here. And you'll notice that the roof is really different than most federal period housing. And that's because this is called a mansard roof. This was something that came over from Paris in the late 19th century. And there was a period, 1870s when these were so fashionable, <coughs> excuse me. And there, there were a lot of uh, buildings that had these added to them. So they never would have built this roof in the 1820s. So that, that roof is not original. Uh, originally, this roof would have been just typical pitched roof with the dormer win windows peeking out of the attic. So that's a later addition. Once you start to recognize these pieces, it, it's fascinating because you can start to um, read the, the buildings and see when, when things happen to them. And it's um, fascinating to be able to do that. Just down the block, now this is uh, two other houses. Um, one of them is from the 1830s. The one on the corner is from 1825. So that's early on in Brooklyn Heights. Again, you can see the pitched roof here, with the two dormer windows. And you might notice that there are these windows on the side of the building that don't have glass in them. Those are called blind windows, blind windows. And sometimes those are windows that were filled in later with brick. But in this case, and often in buildings of this period, those were an original part of the design. And it's, it's um, they were just doing it to make, maintain the proportion of the facade 
rather than just having a stretch of just blank brick wall. I'm not sure what's behind these, but probably uh, stairways or a stairway or something. And uh, so there, those were probably part of the original facade. The house next to the one on the corner originally would have had a pitched roof, I think, but I think that third story was added later. And then uh, a few blocks to the south. This is a federal period building. It's a kind of a late for the federal period. This is 1830s. And you'll notice that it's taller than some of the buildings we've looked at. This has the three stories above the parlor level, above the garden level rather. So there's the story below the, slightly below the street and then the parlor, parlor level that meets the stoop. And then this one has two stories above it plus the attic, which you can see up there, there are dormer windows peeking out. And then also this has the fan light, which we saw in Edinburgh in the Georgian architecture. This has the fan light detail that was kind of a fancier version of the typical Georgian uh, doorway. And then just across the street, there are three buildings, three houses from the 1820s. And these are interesting because if you edit out the, the huge apartment building behind it, you can start to imagine what Brooklyn Heights would have looked like in the 1820s when every house was like this in the whole neighborhood and there were entire blocks that were just lined up with these houses. Uh, so here you have three in a row, so you can kind of get an idea of what that might have looked like. Um, the two on the left, the one on the left, the one in the middle, are pretty much all original. You can see the pitched roofs, the dormer windows. The one on the right has had a third story added to it at some point. Here's an elevation on the left and then four floor plans going from lowest to highest. And let's, let's go through each level. So starting with the garden level, uh, which you can see um, from the sidewalk, you would walk down three or four steps and enter a sideway and, and, and a, enter a doorway underneath the stoop, which are the, the steps leading up to the parlor level. So you go down underneath the stoop and then into um, the garden level. And uh, this is discussed in the, in the reading in the Charles Lockwood uh, Bricks and Brownstone, who talks about this, where things were inside a typical house. The bottom level would typically have the kitchen and a kind of informal dining room. So unless you had guests over or something like that, most families would eat down there. So those two spaces there uh, are kitchen and dining room. Then if you walk through the house, you get to a backyard. And that's the backyard here. And this round object in the backyard is a cistern. Cistern, and that's for catching rainwater because a lot of these houses were built before the Croton Aqueduct was built. And so they're <clears throat> at least partially relying on <clears throat> catchment basins like that to collect water. Um, what they didn't know is that those cisterns are excellent for breeding mosquitoes and the mosquitoes carried a virus called yellow fever, which in the late 18th century and early 19th century periodically decimated the population of New York and other cities. So let's look at the parlor level is here. 
So you would come off the sidewalk, up the stoop and in through the main door. And you would arrive, you see, in a hallway with the stairs leading up right in front of you. And then those rooms to the right, if you hang a right there coming in the door, you can wander through the rooms. Um, you can see that there's like a, the interstitial part there, it often had folding doors or sliding doors. So you could open up the parlor level. So it was almost like one room or you could close it off. Uh, today in all the restored brownstones, that, that back room there is typically the kitchen, but when they were originally built, that wasn't the kitchen. The kitchen was down in the garden level. And these two rooms would have been either been uh, the, um, the back room there would have been probably a dining room for formal occasions, or if they were lucky enough, they might have a library there. And the front, the front room, right when you first come in and hang a right, that room was the parlor. And that was the most important room in the house, the kind of uh, showpiece where they would have their best furniture and everything like that, and where they would receive guests when they came over. So kind of like a living room, but a little more formal than what we understand as a living room. And then if you, so you come in, you wander through the parlor, through those double doors into the back room, which is a library or a dining room, and go up the stairs, and we're gonna go up to the next level, which is the second floor. So you're coming up the stairs. <clears throat> These would be bedrooms. There's one in the back and one in the front. And, and then I, if you see where I put a question mark in that little room in the front, I don't really know what that is. Um, it, it may be talked about in the reading. I think it, it's a room that could have been used as a sewing room uh, or it could be used as an office or ex an extremely, extremely tiny bedroom. But I don't think it was a bedroom because of the size. So my best guess is sewing room. And then let's look at the attic, which is right here. So the attic level, it was typically a pitched roof, although not always, but in this period, typically a pitched roof and there's windows sticking out from what were called dormers. So you come up the stairs into the attic and you'll notice that it's much more compartmentalized than the lower floors. It doesn't have the ability to kind of flow through the rooms that the parlor level and the second floor did. And these would all be bedrooms. And, uh, you know, they're pretty small compared to the ones on the second floor. So the parents, um, would have slept on the second floor and uh, probably the oldest children would have been down there too. And the attic would have been, you know, the attic is, would have gotten really hot in the summer and it wasn't the nicest place to sleep probably. So those rooms would have been reserved for uh, the younger kids probably. Families were pre pretty big back then. So, you know, Families of six or seven kids were not unusual. So there might've been kids sleeping up there. And also these houses um, that would often include live-in servants. Um, there, were, there were, you know, labor was cheap and there were a lot of immigrants beginning to arrive who were desperate for work. And so even a middle-class family could afford a servant or two. And so um, these rooms might've been the bedrooms of servants. How did they heat these houses? Uh, well, you'll notice there's a chimney along one side and fireplaces at each level, two fireplaces in each wall going up. I forgot to circle the fireplaces on the second floor, but you get the idea. So each level has fireplaces. And those were burning. Wood, so they had to always have wood 
in the readings here, this is chapter two in Bricks and Brownstone. And it's also covered in the Row House Manual. So all of these housing styles that we're talking about, um, the federal style, the Greek revival, the Gothic revival, the Italianate, et cetera, uh, keep in mind that all of these styles were sweeping America at the same time. So we're talking about New York City specifically, but uh, the, these movements of styles um, were happening in Philadelphia and Baltimore and Boston and other places simultaneously. So not just in New York. So where did the Greek revival come from? This was a, a phase of American architecture um, that began to take hold in the 1820s and probably was at its height in the 1830s, 1840s, and began to replace the federal style as the most fashionable style of architecture. It's important to note though that these periods that we're talking about, they didn't have a very uh, very clear beginning and end, like any fashion trend. They kind of just uh, gradually came into use and then gradually faded away with a kind of golden era where everybody agreed that this was the way to do it. And I mean, that, that's true, not just with architecture, but with, with um, clothing, with um, literature, with um, sculpture, philosophy, I mean, ideas come into, just organically come into, into use and, and become prevalent and then kind of gradually fade away and are replaced by something else. So in terms of housing, it's important, really important to note, note that the federal period um, didn't go away completely. And, and there's a period where the federal period just kind of gradually morphed into the Greek revival and then the Greek revival never really faded away. And there, there was even kind of a Greek revival revival in the late 19th, early 20th century. There was even a, a federal revival period in the early 20th century, kind of a neo-federal movement. So we're kind of just talking about periods when it, these styles were at the height of fashion. So why, why the Greek revival? Also, the other thing is that we're beginning to talk about revival styles for the first time. And Charles Lockwood talks a lot about this in Bricks and Brownstone. Um, the beginning of revivals, meaning a, a renewed interest in something, a period of history that had already happened. So when you talk about this in your notes and on the exam and everything, it's really important to always specify that it's a revival period, that you wouldn't just say uh, the Greek architecture of New York, because the Greek architecture literally refers to the architecture of Greece, of antiquity, the, the Parthenon, and all of that stuff. So the fact that it's a revival is really important. So you've got to have both parts in there, Greek revival, Gothic revival. So why do people get interested in the architecture and fashion and culture and everything of ancient Greece? Well, hold on one second. Hold on, I'll be right back. Sorry guys, I had to tell my six-year-old to keep it down. Okay, so uh, one of the main things that happened was uh, that the Greek War of Independence um, happened. And this was, um, the Greeks were trying to get their independence from the Turks. And um, as Lockwood says, and I'm reading from Lockwood here, he says, um, the Greek War of Independence evoked international sympathy for the Greek patriots and kindled even greater interest in the civilization of ancient Greece. 
and especially in America, itself only recently freed from foreign domination from the British. And he mentions the death of the romantic poet, Lord Byron. In the, in the Greek war in 1823, focused worldwide attention on struggle. So Lord Byron was a romantic poet who actually goes to Greece and fights on behalf of the Greek, Greeks and then he dies in battle. And this focused attention on the Greek cause. And this resonated especially with Americans because they had just, not just, but in, in the memory of most people, they had, had only recently become an independent uh, country. So um, this is the Parthenon. And the other thing that happened was that Sorry, guys, hold on a second. I have to shush my six-year-old again. Okay. So this is the Parthenon, of course. Um, and one thing that inspired interest in, in ancient Greece, in ancient Greece architecture, were the, the so-called Elgin marbles. And, and uh, Charles Lockwood talks about this. Um, Lord Elgin was a British ambassador to Greece at the time still under Turkish control. And he received permission in 1801 to take, quote, a few blocks of marble with inscriptions and figures from the Acropolis. Well, what he does is he loots the Acro Acropolis and he takes uh, sculptures and parts of the building from the, from the Parthenon and other buildings, and he brings them back to, to England and puts them on display. And the so-called Elgin marbles created a sensation. People got really interested in Greek architecture. And this became a fad that was called the so-called Greek mania. And it became a fad where this, it wasn't just architecture, but uh, if you look at fashion um, from this period, early 19th century, like if you read the um, novels, uh, Jane Austen's novels, or, or see a movie that's based on her novels, uh, Sense and Sensibility, um, Persuasion, Pride and Prejudice, uh, all the female characters have hairstyles that are based on ancient Greece, they, their dresses are based on, these kind of long flowing dresses are based on the uh, fashion of ancient Greece. You see it in interior decoration, uh, in sculpture and in poetry. Uh, poetry is really influenced by the ancient Greek poets in this period. And it becomes this fad called the Greek mania and Lockwood talks about, about this here. He says, he quotes um, so, uh, an English resident, and this is 1834, he says, the Greek mania here is at its height, as you would infer from the fact that everything is a Greek temple, from the privies in the back court through the various grades of prison, theater, church, custom house, and state house. So it wasn't just in housing, but American architecture in this period begins to copy the classical forms of Greek antiquity. And you see it in prisons, theaters, churches, and um, courthouses and the like. And we're just talking about housing, but it was in every kind of architecture. And this, this Greek mania completely dominated American architecture from the late 1820s to the late 1840s. Uh, swept from the East Coast into the Midwest, as far as Iowa and Wisconsin, was especially well received in the Deep South, which we'll look at in a second. Um, and it says, Lockwood says, so strong was the sway of ancient Greece and classical antiquity, that by the end of the rage, the Greek mania of the United States had gained not only countless Greek revival structures all over the nation, but also 15 Romes, 12 Carthages, and 27 Troys. So they were naming uh, new towns after 
places in, in ancient Greece. So there was, uh, just in New York State, there was um, Attica, Carthage, Corinth, Delphi, Ithaca, Palmyra, Phoenicia. I've been to, I went to Phoenicia last summer. I got a really good pizza there. Rome, Syracuse, Troy, Utica, all of these new towns that were founded during this period were, had names that were inspired um, by ancient Greece and ancient Greece and Rome, I should say. Um, so here's another uh, quote from Bricks and Brownstone. Lockwood is quoting a newspaper article from 1829, which says, there is more life and spirit and variety in New York in one day than in all other cities put together. New York is Athens revived. Everybody wants to know what's the news. So did they in ancient Athens. So now there are comparisons between New York, a growing city struggling to find its identity, and ancient Athens. So in terms of architecture around New York, you can see the Greek revival clearly in so many buildings that survive from this era. era. One of them is um, Sailor Snug Harbor in Staten Island. And building C, you can see here, you can see that from eight, this is 1833, so the height of the Greek mania. You can see how it's borrowing the forms of the Parthenon, right? The, the big uh, portico entry, entryway with those six ionic columns, the heavy pediment above the colonnade. Basically turning, trying to turn every building into a Greek temple. Really, that's what they're trying to do. And you see it again here in Brooklyn uh, Borough Hall, which is from 1848, again, the six Ionic columns out front, that grand staircase leading up to the doorway, which um, I love to sit on those steps and watch skateboarders try to try to uh, shred those steps. It's great. Anyway, and then the, the high, um, the, the strong pediment above the portico and the symmetry and the use of stone and everything. And Lockwood says that the Greek revival caught on all through the deep south. And, and yeah, no doubt. I mean, this is a, a plantation, a sugarcane plantation uh, from 1846 in Louisiana. And again, you can see the aspirations to make every house into a Parthenon. And in New York, uh, going back to New York, this is Federal Hall, which is still there from 1842, this is at, um, on Wall Street. And this is on the site of the original New York City Hall. And so when they're designing um, public buildings, it was a little more obvious how they would um, mimic the forms of ancient Greece. A temple in Greece becomes a bank or a hospital or a government building. But how does it become housing? That's what I want to talk about. So the Greek revival was adapted to the row house typology and the row houses are very similar to the federal period, but philosophically very different. And the forms become, begin to get a little more exaggerated. But you know, row houses being row houses compared to a temple, they're pretty restrained. But these are Greek revival row houses in Duralum Street in Brooklyn Heights. And I'm wondering if you see any differences between the federal period and the Greek revival. So they have, you know, all the same parts. There's a cornice up top. You'll notice that the roof is, is flat. So that's one difference going from the federal period to the Greek revival is that we're going from 
predominantly pitched roofs to flat roofs. Um, the windows uh, are pretty much the same as the federal period, pretty simple, a lintel up top, a sill below. They often will have a base of brownstone, you can see there. And when they were built out of brick, and Greek revival houses were also built out of stone or built out of wood, but or brownstone, but typically they were built out of brick. And there's a the houses from this period typically use the pattern called English bond. So as opposed to the Flemish bond, um, these are alternating courses of headers and stretchers. So an entire course of headers followed by an entire course of stretchers, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes you also see something that's even more simple, which is just running bond, which is just, you know, stretcher, stretcher, stretcher. The doorways are really where you start to notice a difference most between the federal period and the Greek revival. So here you can see these are um, in uh, facing Washington Square in Manhattan. This is a famous row of Greek revival houses. And you can see that the doorway is trying to mimic a Greek temple and there's a doorway within a doorway. So the federal period um, kind of had that going on too, the doorway within the doorway, but it's much more exaggerated in the Greek revival period where the, the doorway really starts to jut out from the facade. You can see in the image on the right there, there's actually space between the columns and the brick wall. So it's, it's like it's a separate temple that you enter through into the house. Um, it's also, you can see in the, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but in that wrought iron gateway that's leading to the stoop, you can see these um, little Greek designs. Those are all original. So it starts, you know, the Greek revival is still pretty restrained in terms of ornamentation, but you start to see these little motifs. This is in, in my neighborhood on Warren Street this intact row of Greek revival houses. Again, you can see how exaggerated the, the entrance, entrances are getting and they are mimicking the form of a, of a Greek temple. But other than that, they're really pretty simple. Again, here you can see the brownstone bases, the lintels and the sills are brownstone. And then the doorways are actually made out of wood. And it's amazing that they've lasted this long and they're intact. because wood doesn't always last, but I guess they've been taken care of. That um, repetitive block uh, design there you can see is called a dental course, which I talked about last week. And you can see that these are made out of wood and uh, I would imagine that column is, is a hollow piece of wood. And uh, you know, as long as you keep painting them, this one needs a, looks like it needs a, some scraping and painting. As long as you take care of them, they should last. And I guess these people just took care of them because they're still looking great. And I wish I owned one of them, but I don't have the money. These things probably go for like $5 million a piece. Um, and then often you'll see a doorway that's made out of brownstone, which we haven't talked about yet, but brownstone is a, it's a type of sandstone. It was quarried in Connecticut and New Jersey, so it was plentiful locally, and it was um, relatively cheap compared to marble. Um, and it's very easy to carve, which we'll see in the Gothic Revival and the Italianate. It, it was it's a very soft stone, so they could they could carve lots of interesting ornaments into them. But here it's kind of just restrained. Um, you can see the lintel up top there. And then in the, in the federal period, we saw the colonnettes on either side of the door. Here they're heavier and they're called pilasters, pilasters. 
Uh, and then you see a recessed wooden door. And here's some just some other examples of variations of the Greek Revival doorway. Sometimes the doorway is arched. Sometimes the, the pilasters are round. Sometimes they're rectangular. So the emphasis on the, in the federal period was on uh, simplicity and purity of expression and uh, restraint and proportion. Once we get into the Greek revival, which is operating philosophically from an entire, entirely different place, there's more of an emphasis on mystery, more of an emphasis on shadows, exaggeration, and geometry. So if you think about it, if you pull the doorway off the building a little bit, you're going to create more shadow lines. Um, so they wanted that to create a, kind of, uh, a certain mood, a sense of mystery. Why would they want to do that? Well, this is really important that they're that the Greek revival philosophically is coming from a different place than the federal period. Federal period is really coming out of the Enlightenment. It's coming out of uh, a sense of uh, logic and symmetry and mathematical proportion. The federal period is really, um, the, the commissioner's plan really came out of those federal period ideas, the kind of mathematical logic of the plan. The same ideas were uh, taking hold during the federal period in housing. Um, it was really a product of the enlightenment. It's all about rationality. And then we talked about the romantic movement when we were talking about Central Park. So the romantic movement is becoming more accepted and gaining a foothold in the late 18th, early 19th century. And the Greek revival was really part of that romantic movement. So while the forms of the federal period and the Greek revival are very similar, the kind of similar quotations of of ancient Greece and Rome, philosophically, they were very different. And Lockwood talks about this in Bricks and Brownstone. So I'm just gonna read uh, what, he, what he says about this, which is, he says, uh, and this is on page uh, 56, chapter two. He says, the Greek revival style introduced an age of revivals to American architecture that lasted for several decades. Although the Greek Revival row house was similar in appearance to the federal, its design expressed a far different aesthetic intent. Rather than relying on the pleasing proportion, handsome materials and modest ornament of the classical tradition, as did the federal style, the Greek Revival, and indeed all revival styles, self-consciously recalled a distant time or place and its architecture. A revival style tried to evoke an association that stimulated the emotions. For Andrew Jackson Downing, noted landscape gardener, so we met Downing when we were talking about Central Park. For Andrew Jackson Downing, revival styles provided, and this is, no, Downing is talking, another source of pleasure to most minds, which springs not from beauty of form or expression in these styles, but from personal or historical associations connected with them, in which by a process half addressed to the feelings and half to the intellect, makes them in the highest degree interesting. Now this is Lockwood talking again. By replacing beauty of form or expression as an architectural standard, with personal or historical associations, the revival style rejected classical traditions, the classical traditions ideas that forms were beauty, beautiful only in themselves. And it instead accepted the romantic movements concept that forms were beautiful for the emotions they evoked. So this is exactly what happens later with Central Park, right? And the important thing here is that uh, these Greek revival houses 
were meant to um, provoke, evoke an association, meaning an association with another distant time and place, which was ancient Greece and Rome, and that you were meant to understand them on an emotional level. And they did that by exaggerating things, by creating shadows, by making things kind of out of proportion to make sure that you got that, that association. So everything about the Greek revival was just kind of uh, more uh, exaggerated than the federal period. Here you can see, uh, this is a, a doorway that we were, gonna, we were going to see on one of our walking tours you can see that there's a, this is a brownstone temple grafted onto the facade. It's got this heavy pediment above. It has this detail on the side where it kind of juts out. Those are called Greek ears. You see that both on the exterior and interior often in houses around doorways. So everything is just kind of exaggerated and enlarged. So in the interiors as well, we're really surprising. Uh, things got much more uh, ornamental. You can see this crown molding around the, the ceiling has kind of like a double layer. And this is a contemporary house, a restoration of an old Greek revival house. But you can see that they've, that they've restored it. You know, the, the, that, that's a modern painting on the wall and there are stereo speakers and stuff like that. So just ignore that. But uh, and ignore the furniture. But that paint color was typical of this period. That I love that just like bright, uh, dynamic red color that they plaster all over the walls. So things are, the interior colors are getting much more, uh, much brighter and more contrasty. You can see that the surrounds around the windows are in, in and of themselves Greek columns. And um, also the, the windows are getting bigger. They go all the way down to the floor. So things are just getting more exaggerated. And I think also the ceiling heights are getting taller too. And the ornament that does appear begins to be more cohesive throughout the building on the facade, in the interior, and even down to the, the railings around the stoop. And, and the, you often see them, the ones that are intact still have this kind of Greek key motif. Uh, so even it's something as mundane as the railing. You see the Greek forms. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the Gothic revival. And that part is gonna be in part two. So lecture nine, part two. So you wanna to go to that and we'll talk about the Gothic revival and then the Italianate. Okay, see you later.